Hey, welcome to the podcast. My name is Eric Cortina. I'm your host. I have been a competitive long range shooter for over a decade now, but I'm still in learning mode. That's the reason that I started this podcast, because I want to talk to people that I can pick their brains and learn something from. Now, why did I call it Believe the Target? Well, the target is really the only one that tells the truth. There's many ideas, many theories, many experts. However, the target ultimately decides who's right. Anyway, if you're not subscribed to this podcast, make sure you subscribe right now. Go give it a like and let's get started. Scott, how you doing, man? I'm doing great, Eric. How you doing? <laughs> I'm doing good. So we met at RCO Rock Truck Olympics. And uh I just uh man, I just had to have you on because uh you got a quite a interesting story. Well, I mean I guess some might say call it interesting, but uh, yeah, no, it was it was great to 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 meet you as well at the Rock Chuck Challenge. It was a really cool event, and uh, I mean honestly, I would have liked to spend a little bit more time with you and and some of the other shooters to kind of pick your brain. But um, you guys were busy getting ready for the con the the, the competition and. And, uh, you know, I was busy, like, running around, setting up stages and stuff like that. So it, it really didn't work out. But we did have a little bit of time to talk when we went out and had a couple of drinks. So yeah. that was that was pretty cool. And I, I kind of picked your brain a little bit about some things, you know. I was like, I got to get, I got to, I got to, I got to talk to Eric because I've got all this, all these questions, you know. And I'm like, now I don't have to worry about going, you know, online and searching the internet. It's like, I've got the man right here. I got the man. <laughs> so I can ask whatever I want. I want to get answers. You can imagine how silly I felt to have someone like you, you know, Green Beret that did all these uh, military, military background to have, to be asking me <laughs> about shooting. But I guess it's different. Obviously, I don't know. I don't have any experience, military experience. All I have is paper punching experience but yeah. you know anyway i uh i hopefully i gave you some good pointers oh no absolutely you know and um you know with with my job now it's it's you know i'll go out and i'll get to shoot rifles and and, and test them out if it's a new rifle or if, or if it's a new build and and i'm and i'm trying to i'm looking i'm trying to squeeze out the most accuracy i can and uh, i have noticed that there is definitely a difference between shooting an ar platform accurately compared to shooting like a bolt gun you know it, there's just it's a different feel um and it, and, that, and that's what it, that's what we were talking about it's like you know all the stuff that happens after you pull the trigger you know even though it's happening in a split second um yeah so and and so that's what i was kind of wanting to find out is like hey what am i doing wrong or if there's something i can do that's different or is there a difference in shooting uh, the AR platform and, and the, um, and, and a bolt gun and just like, what, what are some of the techniques I could do to kind of help, uh, and, you know, better, better the groups because there just seems to be more, again, I'm, I'm talking like really small time here, but movement after the trigger was pulled, like after the hammer falls with, with, uh, with, with, with the buffer and, and, and the spring and, and just, it just, it seems like it takes longer. And so it's almost like, you have to be able to maintain that perfect position uh, longer after you pull the trigger. It, it, I mean, that's so that's kind of the, the the rabbit hole I was going down. Is like, hey, how how is this happening? And like, what's going on there? And is, and is there a difference? So, right. And you know, I was <laughs> I was shooting an AR, and honestly, that's the first time I've ever done any kind of competition with an AR. Like, I I have an AR, but literally I go sighted in takes me, I don't know, five, 10 shots. And then I go shoot hogs with it. I don't, <laughs> I don't do yeah. anything other than that. So I probably had less than a hundred rounds through an AR in my life. And mm -hmm. now I have to compete with an AR, which was, uh, for me, it was totally different, mm -hmm. uh, but they were surprisingly very precise, very accurate. Uh, I was blown away, honestly. Yeah, I, I think I think a lot of people are. There's a lot of people out there that <clears throat> I think they you know they think that ARs aren't aren't very accurate and 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 you know of course there's limitations. If, you know I don't I don't think an AR will ever be 
as accurate as the bolt gun, just because there's so many different var variables in the process and, 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 the, and the barrels on a true free, free floating barrel because there's a gas tube and there's just a lot of stuff going on. Um, but yeah, there, I think, I think with today's machining processes and this, the way that people machine barrels now or companies, it's just, uh, you can shoot, I mean, ARs are very accurate. Um, so it's, it's definitely something that I think has changed over the course of the years. So, um, with your background, let's talk about your background a little bit. Obviously you guys, or you have a ton of AR experience. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. That is correct. Mm -hmm. I would say that the AR was, was definitely our primary duty weapon. Um, we, you know, we had a lot of different ones. We, we had like, you know, this big walk-in um, safe where we had all our stuff and we had, we had multiple ARs in different lengths. We had uh, an SR-25, which was our sniper AR. Um, we had bolt guns that, cause I was also on, on a, in, in a sniper troop as well. So uh, not only did we do everything that um, a regular assaulter would do, but then we had the additional task of being uh, a, a sniper as well. So we had multiple different sniper systems and ARs and pistols. And so it was like, uh, it was like, you know, uh, a dream come true. I mean, you walk into this, this safe and you have literally everything to shoot. And it, it was a lot of fun. Yeah. So, uh, what did you do in the, in the, you were in the army, correct? <laughs> Yes, I was uh, Army Green Beret and, and, and Army Special Operations for, uh, well, I have a total of tw just shy of 22 years in. Um, and most of that time, over half that time was in uh, Army, Army Special Operations. You wish it was smaller. Are you tired of having the biggest one in your group of friends? You want to shrink your groups? Go to shootsmallgroups.com and become a member. Once you become a member, you will have access to our member forums. There you'll find our marketplace. You'll also find Eric's forum. This is where I post all the videos that'll help you shrink your groups. You'll find the live streams, scope mounting, Eric's one-on-one -on -one help. You'll also have a forum for equipment maintenance, 6BR load development, 6.5 needs more series remember that all the data is here oh this is a popular one this is a prs reloading series here i have all my load development for prs now if you're more interested in how i do my load development for f class well guess what i also have that it's called the f class reloading series all those videos are in here so anyway become a member today and watch your friends surprise faces as you pull out the smallest one they have ever seen next time they see you <laughs> so what was the training like with with ars uh i mean I, I don't you know i have no idea what the training is like as to how what is it that you need to be proficient at is it long range shot short range quick i don't know i would say really it wasn't so much of the long range stuff now if we were shooting our s or 25s yes we were doing long long range um I'd say most of the uh, SR-25 stuff, if we're doing some type of sniper operations, it would be a thousand meters and in. Um, and then we would, you know, so it would be very similar to going out to the range and just trying to shoot the tightest groups at, at distance, you know, practicing calling call in winds, which is always the main variable when you're talking about being, be, being accurate with any gun. Um, but if it wasn't the SR-25, then it was just a lot of, uh, I don't know, I'd say it more like, I hate using this, the, the uh, term, but tactical or combat style shooting. It was more, it's more for speed, more up close. I would say most of it, most of our shooting and our training was done 200 meters and in. Um, but, but we would push the limitations of our AR, AR platform. Um, our, my, my main staple, the thing that, or the weapon that I would go to or do most missions with was uh, a 10 and a half inch barrel. So, um, you know, it was a lot of fast shooting, a lot of, a lot of CQB, a lot of shooting inside the, uh, shooting inside a shoot house. 
a uh, lot of uh, range work, like I said, 100 meters and in, using steel targets, reactive targets, steel targets. Um, but, you know, we would all, you know, I would, well, a lot of times I would start off on paper to make sure that the zero is still good, everything's still um, no, nothing got knocked off or anything like that. I would only, I, and even, even today, like I started my training back then on paper just to kind of, for me, it's kind of like a confidence thing. If I can go out and on paper shoot a tight group that I know that my weapon platform is capable of, then I'm like, it's, you know, it's good to go. The zero is good. Um, and then we did a lot of shooting at night, um, under nods with, with lasers. So, um, that was also a, a big part of it. Um, so I would say mostly it's like speed shooting, up close, uh, a lot of steel, or if it's inside the sh uh, shoot house on paper. I see. So what kind of expectations did you guys have from an AR platform? Uh, well, I, I would say like, I don't know what the requirement was whenever the platform was purchased, but I mean, uh, the platforms we would shoot was, would, would stay within a minute and a half MOA at a, at, 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 at 100. So, I mean, they were, they were very accurate, especially for being a short barrel rifle. Um, so I guess the expectation would be nothing over, nothing more than say a minute and a half. I see. Yeah. Because I mean, you guys are doing close quarter stuff, right? So you don't need it. <laughs> you're not, you're not going to competitions and shooting at paper like we do. Uh, no, no. It's targets more, are a little it's bit more, bigger. Yes. Yes. It's more about, I guess in our training, it was more about, we did a lot of um, stress inoculation through training. So, you know, a lot of people and cause I, I, I trained, um, mostly law, law enforcement and some civilians for years before I started working at SAG. And, uh, the one thing that I noticed that was absent in most of the law enforcement training was training, uh, was training uh, under stress. So, um, a lot of guys would, would do fine, um, on the range shooting at paper where the target's not moving. You're, you're not moving. You're just, you know, you're shooting groups or you're doing a, a very simple drill. Um, and most people was, you know, they were okay with that. And then it's funny, you, you know, you, uh, introduce stress either in the form of a competition at the end of the day, you know, once that buzzer goes off, you know, that, you know, just the stress of competition, everybody wants to, wants to do well, um, would, I mean, everybody would just fall apart or, if you're doing some, some type of training inside a shoot house, whether it's simunition or not. Um, and most of our training, I, well, all of our training, um, that I, that I would do was, was simunition, but even with simunition, you know, just the stress of one, you know, trying to, you know, do the right thing or you're thinking about is, you know, am I doing the, doing the tactic correctly? So you're kind of overwhelmed. You know, I always say that the, their, their, their cup was overfilled, was, was over full because they're thinking about a lot of external stuff and that's why we did so much training inside the shoot house and up close is because you can't think at all about shooting you can't think about manipulating the safety you can't sh think about finding your 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 your, your sights you can't think about anything else because you your your mind has to be open and focused on everything that's happening in the room you know is that a gun is that a cell phone is this is this person a threat and there there, there could be a lot of things going on in a room i mean i've been i went in rooms where there's 15 kids in a room and you're like holy crap you know and it's like what do you do? And you're, you know, you're, you're scanning your sector, you have a job to do and you can't, you can't get overwhelmed. You have to think, okay, you have to look for a threat, eliminate a threat if there is one. And if not continue on. So I think a lot of it is just shooting fast and accurate up close, but also in, uh, introducing that stress, uh, stress inoc inoculation in our training. That was a big part of it. So how do you prioritize? I mean, obviously you just pointed out, you know, you introduce, stress and all of a sudden people fall apart how do you go from that point to the point that you're at where you can automatically assess a target you can automatically assess the danger you can automatically uh prioritize the targets and and label the targets whether there is one so how do you because uh, you know at first it's kind of like <laughs> it just the brain just goes blank so right. how do you go from that to what you able to do? Well, the first thing you need to do, and it's like, um, 
in any, uh, as far as I know, especially in, in, in the army, anyhow, any unit that, it, that specializes in CQB close quarters battle, the very first thing you do before you start going, before you even enter a shoe house is you do, uh, months of sh- flat range work. So you shoot, 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 you shoot all the time. You're shooting with your pistol, you're shooting with your carbine and you're just, just on the range, like all day long, like, you know, anywhere from six to eight hours a day, you're just, you're shooting. And, um, and there's a, there, there's a, um, a progression to that because whenever, whenever you're in your training, everybody's coming from a different background. So they just kind of, um, you know, they start from the bottom and, a lot of times people aren't trained properly. So, and I know that whenever I, w- I was going through some of my schools, some of the stuff that I learned in the past wasn't correct or wasn't the proper way. And so, you know, then I was taught the proper way. So I had to break, break some bad habits and stuff like that. But you just do a crap ton of shooting on the flat range. Okay. Because again, like I said, when, when you go into a room and you're doing uh, CQB, you can't be thinking about shooting. You can't be thinking about shooting accurately. You can't be shoot, uh, thinking about, like I said, manipulating the safety or or or, or manipulating the gun in any way. That all that has to be like second nature. Because if I'm thinking something with a conscious thought, if I'm consciously thinking about, okay, you know, I'm going in a room. Oh, I see this. Oh, I have to put my gun on fire. Okay, I'm bringing it up. If you're thinking about all that, you're not thinking about where are my buddies in the room? Is it a safe shot? What's behind the target? Is the target a threat? Um, and there could be multiple things going on in, in the room. I mean, just, just complete chaos. So the answer to your question is you get to that point through all, you know, being really good at the fundamentals and basics, which is shooting. And, um, and then as you, and then you have to get to a point to where, okay, my, my shooting is really good. I'm, I, I, I'm doing well enough to where I'm allowed to go in a shoot house now. And I, and, and I look safe on the range. I am not doing anything weird. Then you go into the shoot house Then you have to learn, learn the tactics. So that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother ball of, uh, ball of yarn there or whatever. I mean, that's a whole nother animal because, now you're learning attack. So now you're really starting to think about everything. So the shooting part's good. Sub, it's subconscious. Everything's good there. Now I have to think, okay, am I going left? Am I going right? Do I class my sector here? Do I, you know, now is everything done? Do I collapse down on this door? And, you know, or now there's a closed door. I got to do this because I'm this position or I'm the, I'm the shotgun or I have the, I have the explosives. I'm the, bre-. you know, there's so much stuff that goes on. And you have to get proficient with that because much like when you were shooting, all that, all your tactics and what you do when you enter a room has to be subconscious as well. Like it's, it's, it's ones and it's, it's ones and zeros. It's binary. You know, if this guy does this, I do this. If I'm number one, I'm going here <clears throat> and this is my sector of fire and it never changes. Okay. Which is the importance of that, of having a tactic that is just, it's literally ones and zeros. Okay. So you're taking away a lot of the thought going into a room on where you're supposed to, uh, on what you're supposed to do in the room and where you're supposed to go. Um, And so once all that, once you get the tactics down and the shooting down and all that is pretty much subconscious, now you're to the point and you're training to where you can take it to the next level. And now when I go in there and now I'm seeing everything because I can remember the first time going into the shoot house, um, well, I wouldn't say the, the first time, but when I first started doing it at a, at a high level, I would do a complete run through a shoot house and there might be, you know, there's hallways and, and there's rooms and there's, you know, there might be six or seven rooms and a hallway and, and all this, there's targets in there. There's their, their position in the shoot house in certain places to where it's safe and all this other stuff, but they're also there. So the instructors can watch you to see if you picked up on your targets and stuff like that. But the first time I, the first couple of times I did that, I didn't even remember. Like I, I, I did, I did the run. Everything was pretty good. And then the instructor would ask, okay, so you went in here and you, and, and you shot this, this target. No. And I'm like, uh, I think so. I don't know. I didn't remember because still my, my cup was over full. I mean, I'm, I, I'm, I have so much conscious thought that I wasn't able to retain it. Then towards the end of the training, 
a couple of months later, after doing this all the time, all the time and progressively getting more complex, then it got to the point where I would do the same run and I could tell you, hey, I went in here. I, I was number two in this room. I went down this wall. I took a shot on this on this target here. And I took a target, you know, a shot on this target. And then I collapsed down. I was on this this uh, th- this side of the door. I was number three going into the hallway. Whatever. I could remember everything because at that point, um, now my my conscious thought wasn't over full, and I was actually focusing. I'm sorry, focusing on the task at hand, which is everything that's going on in the building. Okay, not the shooting, not where I'm going, but what's going on, should I take a shot, you know, all the important stuff. Yeah, that's very interesting because in in competition shooting, it's very similar. The mental game is key. And I can see the newer shooters and they stress over things that to me are irrelevant, but they're at the point where they're stressing over all those things, you know, like uh, I've watched shooters just late there and, and uh, they're shooting and they're trying to figure out where to put that piece of brass after they shoot it. In the meantime, the the wind is switching and doing all kinds of things, but yet they're worried about this piece of brass. And uh, when I train, I look at all that and I go, that doesn't matter. At this point, let it hit the ground, let it put in a, get a bag, do something that you train so that it does the same thing every time. And that way you don't have to think about it. Like you can do it without even looking. Uh, but yeah, it's very interesting. Obviously it's nowhere <laughs> at the same level, but it's still similar in a sense of, uh, the brain gets overloaded with, it doesn't take much. Right. Yeah, it, it doesn't. And, and everybody, you know, I, and I'm sure you, you've, you've said this before, uh, even in, in your teachings and everything, but, you know, being really good at something is just really like, everybody's like, Oh, you know, special forces, special operations, you know, your all these advanced skills. And, and, and yeah, I mean, there's, there's, I guess some skills considered advanced, but really what it boils down to is just being very good at the basics, very good at the fun, the fundamentals. Um, that's really all, all that being like special operations is, is really about. It's just you are so good at the fundamentals and the basics that you do them so quickly and you execute them, uh, e- execute them so perfectly and quickly and efficiently that, um, you know, it looks fast. It looks like, oh, my God, it's just super. But really, you know, in your mind, just like in, in I'm sure like in, in shooting and in, 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 in a competition, it's like, you know, in some ways, time stands stills because you're so focused and you're so into what you're doing that you're, you're really unaware of everything else around you because you, you know, you're, you're, you have a job to do and you're, and, and, and you're focused on it. So, um, yeah, it's, it's very interesting, but really it's just being good at the basics. Yeah. It, it becomes, like you said, binary, like step three doesn't happen until step two. Exactly. Yeah. And it simplifies it. Yeah. And they don't get, out of order <laughs> uh, yeah. when when you're fresh when your new stress just has a way to you know you have this list of things you have to do and stress has a way of just kind of mixing them all up and then all of a sudden you do one and then you're trying to figure out if you skip the step or if or what's next all that happens and that's when uh, things kind of go sideways Exactly. You know, and also I I used to, there's a saying I used to say when I was instructing, it's like, I would ask my students, how, how do you eat it, eat an elephant? And there, you know, a lot of them would look at me and I was like one bite at a time, man. You know, it's like, it's, it's a big task. It's a big job. Okay. But, you know, just do, just go where you're supposed to do, uh, where you're supposed to go, start your sector where you're supposed to start it, collapse your sector, the correct sector. And you just take it step by step. And if you just do that, then everything else becomes easy because if everybody does their piece of the pie, then collectively you're being very efficient and you don't miss anything. Um, it's the guys that they want to go fast and they want to go fast before they're ready to go fast because speed and and, and, and making the right decisions it, it is the byproduct of good technique. So if I try to go fast because I want to be cool or if I want to look fast or I want to look like I'm really good at what I'm doing, 
before you're ready, that's when a lot of the mistakes happen. And I'm sure it's the same way with, with, with the competition. Like, you know, you are on the clock, you are trying to beat the, you're trying to get a good tight, tight group and all that stuff. But you're also, I don't know uh, with uh, F class, but I mean, a lot of times there is a time standard. So if you start thinking about the time, like, Oh my God, I got to hurry up. I got to hurry up. Well, now you're not thinking about what you're supposed to be thinking about at that moment, which is everything you need to do to make that perfect shot or to make a decision because you're thinking about time. And I think that's that, 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 that's why competition, I love competition as a way to induce stress and to become a better soldier, a better shooter. Um, because competition just, that it's that stress. And it's like, you have that, that clock ticking and you have to learn to put the time out of your mind. You have to learn to not think about any of the external, you know, uh, stuff that's going on and focus on the task at hand. And that, um, you know, that, that bleeds over into a lot of aspects of shooting, you know, between the shooting and, and, and being a soldier and, 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 uh, combat missions and CQB and stuff like that. It's all really comes down to, you know, being able to get rid of all the external thought and focus on the task at hand. Yeah, that stress management is key to competition. And obviously, I mean, technically, in, in a weird way, you guys are also in competition in combat, right? You're yeah. Trying to get yeah. The, <laughs> it's trying just different. Win, right? The targets are shooting back. Yeah, but uh, yeah. uh, how much of that do you think competition sports bleeds into the military or vice versa? Like, you know, knowledge. Uh, or do you think they just kind of help each other in some way? No, it, it absolutely bleeds over. Um, a really good example of this. Okay. Um, so I, I stopped deploying in 2012. Um, and you know, with, with the unit that was in, we had the best of the best equipment. Um, uh, we always had the latest and greatest, the best training, the best everything. Okay. Um, now today I'm talking to some of my buddies who are still in and the way they're setting up, up their rifles a lot of times, like for example, having a red dot off to a 45. So when I was in, that was something that no one would ever do. Okay. But because of three gun, because that become, that became a thing in three guns. So you can shoot faster because then you don't have to adjust your variable power scope. Or if you have something up close, you can just flip it over to the side. I, you know, I can't and engage targets quickly. And so now that's actually something that is, is um, it's more of a common practice. So it kind of served, it's kind of twofold. You have a way of shooting up close fast. If you have um, uh, um, a magnified optic on there, but it's also a backup side as well. So it serves two purposes. Um, but yeah, I think, I think it does, um, bleed over. And I think, um, I think both sides have something to learn from each other. I mean, as a good example, um, whenever we would have, uh, it was common for us to bring in, uh, professional shooters, um, and have, and have them run a class. And the reason for that is like, obviously we're not looking at the professional shooter to come in and teach us how to do tactics. We already know how to do that. What we're looking at is how can we shoot better? How can we become more efficient? How can we shoot more accurately? Um, so we bring in the best shooters in the world. They put on a clinic or a class. And then that knowledge is, is transferred into um, everybody in the unit. Um, and it's just, it's, yeah, I mean, because if you want to stay at the, at, the, at the leading edge of anything, you have to bring in the best in the, best in the world. Again, they're not, you know, a lot of these shooters, they're not doing tactics, but we're not asking them to. We just want to look, hey, this one little piece over here, the shooting aspect, teaches everything you know. Like, how, how did you become a world champion? How did you become uh, a three-gun champion or whatever? Um, and then what we do is we take that knowledge – and we apply it into the space that we operate in, which, to be honest with you, I would say, I mean, this is an arbitrary number, but probably something like 98 percent of it does transfer over. There's just certain things that wouldn't make sense or it's not applicable because maybe it's because we're in full kit and body armor and, you know, we, we have we have ballistic helmets and we have flashlights. You know, we have a lot of external stuff that it's not just about the shooting, but um yeah, it, it does transfer over and, and there's a lot to be learned from, from, from both, both, both sides, I believe. 
Yeah, because, I mean, three gun, they're trying to shoot fast and precisely. And, you know, that's <laughs> that's kind of important for for what, you know, what you did. Yeah, absolutely. And I remember I was out at a, um, I was doing some, some sniper training in Texas with a guy named Todd Hodnett. And, um, he, you know, I, I was shooting at a target. It was 900 meters out. I was using my SR-25. And it was like a 10-inch plate which is a pretty, it's a, it's, it's a difficult shot, but doable. And I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm looking at the winds and, and they're just, they're doing all kinds of stuff. They're left, right, swirling. And I'm trying to figure it out and I'm taking my shots and I'm just barely misses. I'm like scaring that target, man. I'm like just, just to the left, just to the right. Just, I mean, all of and I'm like, man, like, I mean, if it was a, a human sized target, I would, I would have hit it, but I wasn't precise enough. And then, and then I looked at Todd I'm like, what am I doing wrong? And so he makes a wind call. He tells me what, what to hold. I hold it and bam for a first round hit. And I'm like, how did you do that? And he's like, you know, I've been, I mean, that's what I do. I, I read winds. And I said, well, how, like, what are you doing? So he says, it's a lot of things, you know, it's like, I'm feeling it in my ears. Like he moves his head around and he's like, his ears tell him a lot of stuff like the wind, where the direction of the wind, he can kind of get a feel for how fast the wind's going. And then he looks at the wind at different points, you know, uh, to the target. It might be halfway to the target or three, three quarters away to the target. And he's taking in all that, all that data. And based on his experience, he's making a call. And so that little bit of knowledge there, I mean, that knowledge right there, I took that and I applied that to my military sniping. You know what I mean? Like I took that and that, that was, it was valuable. So, I'm, you know, there's, there's so much to learn from these, from professional shooters just like yourself who do this all the time and for a living at the highest level. There's a lot to learn. Sometimes it's not so much the knowledge, but just to know that it can be done. Mm-hmm. Cause there's so True. many things that you go, there's, there's no way, no way anybody can do that. And then you see them do it and then you go, okay, number one, now I know it's possible. Yes. Right? And number yes. two, I want to know how to do it because unless you know it's possible, you're never going to go search for the information on how to do it. Right. Right. And what's, 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 what's funny, uh, what's funny about that is, um, is it's not only, is it possible, but it's also is, um, the confidence in my equipment. Can my weapon do this? So the first thing that everybody wants to do, and, and you probably heard this is blame the weapon, the guns off, the ammo's off or whatever. And, um, I, re I remember before going to SODIC, which is, which is sniper school in, in, in the military for special operations. Um, my, uh, team leader, he said, Hey, the one thing I want you to remember is when you're missing, it's not the weapon. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> and I'm like, hey, man, you're not even there. We're not even there yet. He goes, no, 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 it doesn't matter. When you're missing, it's not the weapon. Just know it's something you're doing. And uh, and I always remember that, and it's so true. It's like you can't make excuses. You can't think about the weapon. You know, you have to believe in it. You have to have the confidence. You have to know that it's possible and that your weapon system, it is possible. And if you know that and if you believe that, then you can focus on, okay, I'm not going to play the blame game. I'm not going to blame it on the weapon or the equipment. It's my problem, you know. So, yeah, to your point, that is absolutely true. Yeah, blaming the gun is very easy to do. Uh, <laughs> yes, blaming it is. the equipment. Uh, and obviously, sometimes there's merit to it, but you, that's the reason you have to maintain your equipment. You have to know your equipment. Uh, you know, I talk about cleaning my barrels all the time, and I do, but I also maintain the, the bolt, the springs. I lube everything. I check everything. Uh, I check everything, you know, my screws on my scope. I make sure that everything's correct so that when I do miss, I already know that everything's been checked and there's no blame to be placed on the rifle. It's on me. And then I can even, even bad shots are feedback that I can rely on for the next shot. And that having confidence on your shot, whether good or bad, it's very important. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so no one, like if, if you miss the shot, you can go, okay, I called that. I was a little off, you know, like just knowing that like you recognizing 
that when 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 the gun went off, the sights weren't exactly perfect. And that's 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 still that's that's like another level. I mean, you know, you don't get to that point to where you're able to call your shots and know where and know where they're hitting without spending a lot of quality time behind the gun. But you, you, you bring up another good point. It's like maintaining your equipment to where you have confidence in it, but you're also taking out that variable that there could be something wrong with the equipment, which is so important. You know, the whole maintenance of, of, of equipment, whether it's night vision, whether it's thermals, whether it's your weapon system, whether it's, you know, um, your, your initiators for your explosive, wh- wh- whatever it is, you know, you have to do your due diligence. And then it's part of your, uh, your PCI or your, 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 your pre, uh, pre-combat inspections. Like you have to make sure that everything is in order. Everything is functioning properly. And it's not just because you want it, you don't, you don't want it to fail. Obviously that's probably the main reason, but it's also because you want to have confidence in, in that going into a situation where, you know, in, in a combat, like, Hey, <clears throat> I have confidence in the guys that are around me because they're the best trained or the best guys on, on the battlefield. Like no one can beat us because we are the best. So you have to have that confidence, but also having the confidence in your equipment. Like, Hey, I went out before leaving for a deployment, I, I cleaned my gun, everything is solid. I checked everything, everything's good. Then I went back out, I re-zeroed everything. I checked, you know, the torque specs on just all that stuff, batteries, the contacts, either on, on, on your optics or in your night vision or whatever you're using, you're just making sure the batteries are good, the contacts are good, everything, your, the wires on your weapon is tucked in there. You maybe use some zip strips, tight, everything's tight, you know, it's nice and tight and it's not dangling because you don't want to be going through a door and you grab onto a, you know, a door hinge or something like that. And it rips your, you know, your, your pressure switch off or knocks your light off or something like that. So just having all that or doing those PCIs and making sure that your equipment is solid. Um, it just, it just ensures that, you know, it just gives you more confidence, you know, and it takes out that, that variable of something, the equipment going, going bad during a combat operation or uh, a match that you have a lot riding on it, like the world championship match. Like you want to make sure that it took a lot of time to get here. It took a lot of money. I'm here. I want to make sure that everything is perfect. So if I do lose, you know, if I don't win rather, instead of lose, if you, if I don't win, then, Hey, it was on me. It wasn't my equipment. Correct. You you just there's a lot of work to be done before you hit the range. And I think I personally think matches are won outside the the competition. Uh because that's when you're gonna train, you know, whether it be getting the rifle ready, getting your wind reading skills ready, getting your stress you know, performance in check, getting uh even getting fit. Uh I mean, for you guys, it's, it's major, but you can be the best shooter in the world, but if you're not in shape, uh, you're not going to be able to, uh, do the things that you need to do. And, you know, I mean, F class, yeah, we laid there on the ground. We don't really do much, but the world championship, we shot for 10 days straight. I don't care who you are. You need to be in some kind of a decent shape to be able to last for 10 days shooting every day. You know, waking up at 5 a.m. in the morning, going to bed about 10 or 11, because, you know, again, r- rifle maintenance after you're done shooting. And then being able to cope with that stress of shooting at a world championship <laughs> and still perform when you're tired, when you're hungry, when you're hot, when you're cold, whatever. You know, just be able to perform at the highest level under any circumstance. That's that tough. is that is very tough, and you're absolutely right. I mean, there's so much that goes into it, and I think being in shape, like again, it's one of those fundamental things you have to be good at. I mean, you have to be you you're, 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 you have to have a really good level of endurance. Um, you have to have a certain level of strength because you're you know you're you're in full kit. You're having to climb over walls. You're having to fast rope. You know, climb ladders. All that stuff. So, um, and then. You know, if, uh, you know, you might have a mission where you might have to walk in for two and a half hours or three hours before you get to your target. Or you might have a mission where you're landing close to the target and you're literally at a full sprint, full kit, ladder, weapon, all this stuff running to the target. And then then it starts. Then the real the real business starts. So if you're already tired, 
by the time you get to the breach, well, you've already failed, you know, so you have to, so it's just so fundamentally you have to have that. And to your point about F class, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but breathing is a huge part of that. Being able to control your breathing, being able to slow down your, I want to say like slow down your heart rate, but in a sense, maybe because you're not, you know, you're not overly stressed, you're relaxed. And then and the only way to, to be able to do that is to have a certain level of cardio to where you're able to not get overworked up or, you know, which induces stress, but what calms down stress and everybody, you know, every, everybody knows that. Like if you exercise, if you get up in the morning, you do a run, you do a workout or something like that, you just feel better. Your overall health is better. You're going to be in a better mood. Your resting heart rate's going to be better. It's just going to make everything in your life better. And then when you, when you, when you take that, or when you take shooting into account, and if you're really, really healthy and you have good cardio, then yeah, everything else is just going to be easier. It's just going to be more easier for sure. Yeah, I mean, it's in F class, it's really hard to notice that on a regular, you know, competition because you know we do three days is about the most we do. Uh, but when you, again, most people have not attended a world championship where you're literally shooting for ten days and again the 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 level of stress that you endure i've actually been shooting literally laying down prone i mean i have a front rest a rear bag everything's pretty much supported all i have to worry about is making a good wind call breaking a good shot and when i'm done shooting 20 shots i am literally exhausted from the mental uh exercise that i was doing while just that stress of you know, I mean, it's a one MOA target that we shoot at, at a thousand yards. And just going, man, is this the right call? I see the wind. I see that flag over there. And then you're so tense. I've been so tense before that that one ounce trigger just seems like it won't break. Like I feel like I'm squeezing and it just won't <laughs> go because I'm so tense. And I'm uh -huh. thinking, come on, come on, come on, come on, go, go, go. Right. And it finally goes. And, and it's yeah. uh, after the fact that I, think back at it and I go, how, how stressed was I that that one ounce trigger felt? I couldn't break it. <laughs> Literally, it just felt like I kept pulling on it. But there's a there's a level of stress, obviously nothing like you've experienced in combat, but there's still stress and it still needs to be managed. And Absolutely. you have to have a certain level of fitness and obviously n nothing like, like what you had to do, but it all falls into the same, to some degree, level of preparation absolutely yeah i agree dealing with stress is probably so I, and and i'm sure you can attest to this but there's there's probably and i don't know i'll i'll, I'll ask you like how many people at an f-class match like let's say at, at a world championship okay it, how many people that show up have the ability to win it's a small percentage very small. Uh, like, like when you when you say small, like let's say, so, how how many people uh, show up for like a world championship? So you're gonna end up with about three to four hundred people. Okay. And I'm gonna say out of that, you probably have uh, five to ten percent that can actually win that match. Okay. I'm gonna okay. say more towards the five percent. Okay, so still you're looking at, and I mean, I don't like doing math in public, but what, maybe 10, <laughs> 15 10 to, to 20 15 to 20 people. Yeah. Okay, so so 15 to 20 people that do ha that could win. I mean, they, they are that good. So right. now you take that, that 15 to 20 people, okay, um, out of those 15 to 20 people, okay, it really comes down to, and those people are, you know, like when they to shoot matches throughout the year. Okay. It's a lot of times in my mind, it comes down to who has the best mental game because they like, you just said, there's 15 to 20 people who have the ability to physical ability. who can shoot call wins, everything they're, 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 they're loading. Everything is so, so perfect that they have the ability to win. But a lot of times it's who can clear their mind, and don't let, you know, don't let their mind, um, you know, take control and talk them out of hitting a target. 
Yeah, so Lanny Basham is a mental coach. He's a Olympic gold medalist. And uh he uh he has a book called With Winning in Mind, and that's one of my favorite books to to listen to uh when I go to matches. I mean, I listen to it all the time, but it talks about how he was obviously on the Olympic team and he lost and and he couldn't understand why. <laughs> well, then he started exploring into the mental game and once he figured that out is what allowed him to get to the next level and start winning world championships and you know gold medals at the olympics and uh that is by far the most overlooked aspect of shooting is the mental game and and you're right there's 15 20 people that can win it they have the ability to win it they have the equipment they have the know-how but it's when it comes down to making those decisions as to when to shoot, when not to shoot, you know, how much to move and all that and managing that stress mentally and managing your performance. Uh, that's going to separate, you know, the winners from the also rans. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the thing is training, training your mental game is the hardest. Because, like, if I want to get stronger, I go in there, I lift, I lift weights, I add more weight. Um, if I want to get better at running, I, I do more cardio. I'm, you know, I switch it up a little bit, but I do something that's going to work on cardio. It's tangible. It's physical. It's, it's something you can feel and see and do. The mental game is something that it's, it's in here somewhere, right? You can't see it. You can't put your hands on it. You can't, you know, it's, just, it's not as easy as going out. So you have to figure out how do I how do I learn to manage my, the, uh, the stress of a competition or the stress of combat? How do I do that? And, you know, uh, unfortunately, you know, the, really the only way to, to, to train that is to get to that point of a high level of stress. So that's why, like, I think, you know, the people who shoot competition a lot, which, I mean, if you're in, if you're in the world championship, obviously you shoot, con you shoot com competition a lot, but not everybody can master that mental game. It's just harder. It's just harder to do. And, and to your point, it's not something that people are, are actively working on. You know, they get out there, they're working on maybe shooting movers, maybe shooting a certain a certain distance or what, whatever, or in different wins. But how many people are going, OK, today I'm going to work on my mental game. Like, how do you do that? It's just harder to do. Yeah. So 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 most people neglect that. And then they realize, much like um, the guy you were just talking about. You know, he's like, hey, he he did it. You know, the self analyzation. It's like, hey, why didn't I? I mean, I have everything. I'm I'm really good, but why did it? Why didn't I win? And so he, you know, he took the time to look inward and figure it out. And it wasn't until then that he's like, okay, this is the one piece that was missing was the mental game. And um, so yeah, it is a big deal. And I do believe that most people they just overlook it. Yeah, it's uh, I I. I was one of those that I had to look in and go, what am I doing wrong? I mean, I'm in practice, I'm killing it. Like I, I'm always shooting really good scores. But then when I go to a match, I have really good scores, but I just can't string enough of them together to be able to win. And, uh, and then I realized that when I, when I was winning, my stress level would go up. I mean, it'd go to the point that I had a hard time sleeping just because I, I didn't want to lose, right? Like I started, <laughs> I, I started shooting to not, to not lose instead of shooting to win, which uh, is totally different. Uh, so yes, I would change, is. I would change my strategy. And, uh, so anyway, so I realized I had to, I had to do better in stress. Uh, so what I started doing, I joined a pool league. And then I would put myself, I'd go every Wednesday night and shoot pool for the league. And every Friday night, I'd shoot tournaments. And I would put myself in under stress twice a week for a long time until I got really good at managing uh, stress, you know. Uh, so then I just went, you know, went back to shooting and it transferred immediately. I mean, managing stress once you learn how to manage stress, it'll apply to so many different aspects of your life that it's it's crazy. But I also started reading books and, and really working on the mental aspect. And that, to me, I'm going to say, at least in my experience, 
what's the difference between being a you know kind of a top level competitor to to actually winning yeah i i 100 percent, you know and um kind of like to kind of draw a parallel um between that thought process and the middle game to combat right um the first time that i went the first time i, I was in a combat zone okay um i found myself i was the most scared during that during that time and it wasn't even like um, the, the worst trip that I've ever been on. I mean, you know, at, at that time there was a lot, a lot going on and absolutely there was, um, you know, some of my, um, teammates and at other fire bases, you know, we, we, we'd get the news. They were, they were killed or wounded or something like that. So, I mean, it was definitely, um, stress knowing that, you know, it could be any day. So, and I remember like, just, I, I had a lot of, um, external thoughts like i would think about my uh my daughter who was just who was recently born um i had to think about you know my you know, i was thinking about my family my mom my you know everybody like if something happened to me they'd be so sad and it'd be devastating and my daughter would you know wouldn't wouldn't have their dad growing up i mean there's a lot of stuff going on and it was it was it was negative thoughts okay because i wasn't thinking about winning i was thinking about what happens if i lose because a firefight you know, or combat the way, the way, now, again, everybody's different. Okay. Everybody has to come out, have their own way of dealing with stuff, dealing with stress, dealing with combat. So, so for me, that first trip was, it was, was huge, huge because I learned something. I learned to just not think about all the negative. What if this happened, you know, because that was a negative thought. That was putting, you know, if you believe in like quantum physics and like, you, you know, the energy you put out in, into the into the universe, it comes back at you. You attract the light free, the like frequencies, you know, um, I, I, I just like it actually. I mean, I, I was aware of it after my first trip, but I did not come to terms and come up with the right thought process to to go into combat um, unafraid. Okay. And I'm not saying that like, Hey, I'm, I'm fearless. No, I mean, I had fear. There was times I absolutely had fear, but I, I, I managed it much better because instead of thinking, what if I die? What if I get shot? What if I get blown up? I stopped doing that because there's nothing I can do to stop that except everything I do before I hit the ground in a combat zone. It's all the training. It's all the shooting. It's 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 all the uh, you know all the team events. It's all the it's all the stress uh, you know, stress events we did. It's 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 the preparation of my equipment and everything. It's everything is done before I hit the ground. So if I know in my heart that all that was done at the highest level and I did not cheat myself or my teammates, then I was confident and I felt good because I know guys who were killed in action. They were better than me, smarter than me, faster than me, stronger than me in every way, but they died. And it was, you know, and when I thought about that, I was like, okay, if that's going to happen, it's out of my hands at that moment. It's out of my hands. I mean, I do everything I know how to do everything I've been trained to do. I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm with, like I said, the greatest fighting force. We're working together. Everything's going. So if something happens, it's out of my hands because guess what? No matter what, sometimes no matter what you do, it ain't going to work. You know, so once I came to terms, like I'm not going to think negative anymore. I want to think positive. I'm going to think about winning. I'm going to be the guy who does the shooting first. I'm going to be the guy who doesn't miss. I'm going to be the guy that is going to be victorious after this battle. Or I'm going to be the guy who's going to be victorious after this objective or whatever. You know, that's the mindset that I had. And once once I mastered that, I did. I didn't. I didn't have those that 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 consistent or that constant fear anymore and it allowed me to do my 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 job better because i wasn't thinking of all these external factors i wasn't thinking about my family and 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 my kids and stuff like that i was thinking about right then and there winning so um it's a big part it's a big deal it's a huge deal and um and i, I think that is the that is the difference between being you know really good at something and being, you know, the ultimate best at something. And it's just, it's a fine line, but it's, it's the mental game. That's, that's the, that's the difference. That's where you can take, I mean, like I said, some of the best shooters and the best, the best soldiers, the best assaulters in, in world, 
But, you know, if they don't understand how to um, control the stress, how to get rid of the negative thoughts, how to think the right way to think to be positive in your thinking. All right. We should be good. All right. So we'll see. Let's give it a shot. <laughs> all right. So so you go through all this training. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Obviously, just. What was your background before the military? Did, were you familiar with guns at all? A little bit. I mean, I've always I've always liked like guns. I, I but I wasn't brought up really hunting or using guns or anything like that. Um, I, I shoot guns here and there, so I really didn't have an extensive background. When I first joined the army, I was I was a mechanic. I wanted to be an airborne ranger. That was that's because you know I was. You know, I was very active in high school. I was in wrestling. I was in karate. I mean, I was an athletic guy. So, you know, I was like, you know, and I just, I just thought that the Ranger Battalion would be a good, a good place. And then my dad, he was like, hey, you're not going to find a job when you get out of the army as a, as a, as an airborne ranger. So, I was like, okay. So I listened, I listened to my dad like, like, like a good son, and I, I, I joined the army as a mechanic because I figured, hey, it's something that um, I can at least have some type of skill. So. And when I decide to get out, I can do something along those lines. Uh, so I did that and I did that for four years, got out, had a break in service for about two and a half years. Uh, so I went back to school for automotive technology. I became uh, ASC certified master technician. I was working at a, a Dodge dealership in Tampa, which is, which is uh, close to where I was born and raised. I uh, did that, and then I just missed the Army, so I joined the Army again, again as a mechanic. Uh, th this time, instead of a, a M1 Abrams tank mechanic, I joined as a light wheels mechanic, because at the time, they didn't have any, uh, any M1 Abrams mechanic slots, so I did that. Uh, and really, it's just because I was a little bit older, I felt like, you know, maybe it's, maybe the infantry is not, is not for for me at that time. So join the army again, but you know what? I just had this calling and um, I got stationed at Fort Carson in Colorado. Fort, Fort Carson is home of the uh, 10th special, special Forces Group. So I would see those guys around around base and, you know, I just like, man, you know, they, 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 they were always, they looked like they were always doing something. You know, when, when I was a mechanic in the army, it was all about, you have to have shine boots, your, your uniform has, has to be pressed and perfectly shaved and all this other stuff, which really was not for me because I'm not someone that likes to fit into a mold. And, um, even though I did almost 22 years in, in the military, I do not like authority a whole lot. I mean, it's like, I'm kind of that guy that went that, you know, I want to buck it a little bit. Um, but anyhow, I'd, I'd see the guys and their, their boots were dirty and their, you know, hair is longer, they're scrubbed up. And I was like, well, you know what? It looks like the, those guys actually do something for a living. You know, that's something. And I didn't want to worry about all the little things like cleaning my uniform and, or pressing my, my uniform shine and shining my boots and stuff like that. So, uh, I decided to try out for it. And, um, so I tried out for special forces, um, in 99, I made it through. And then I, I was a, um, I was an 18 echo, which is a communications, communication sergeant. I did that, uh, for about five and a half years and then tried out for another army special operations unit, made it through. And, um, I was there for, like I said, about seven and a half years. So, uh, it was a, it was a really good time. Um, it was a really good, um, challenge for me. And I always like a challenge. I always wanted to keep doing something that was, you know, harder, uh, just keep excelling at something. It's just my, my personality. I always want to, uh, have a goal and then go towards that goal and achieve it. It's just, it's just the personality thing. So, so yeah, but yeah, when I started out, I, w I was a mechanic that, that that's where it all started. So you go back to the army. Yep. And now you're in, in communications. Yes. But now you're in special forces. Yes. What goes on after that? Yeah, I got assigned to a team. Um, actually, when, when I first when I first signed into Seventh Special Forces Group, they didn't have a slot for me on the team, so I went to the SIGDET, which is basically um, it's it's a detachment where it's kind of like um, I guess you say it's like it's like it's like the B team. So I'm not on a team, but I'm supporting teams, um, which was kind of cool because then I really got to get my hands in uh, working with all the equipment that is at group. 
Um, and then I got a lot of practice doing, doing that. Um, but I really wanted to be on the team. So they, so then, you know, whenever there's a school or something that's, that, that comes down, um, the section sergeant or the team sergeant would, you know, put it out and he's like, Hey, there's a slot or there's availability if you want to go through combat dive school. And so I was like, shoot, I'll do it. I love to swim. I love the water. Uh, I'm very natural. And I mean, I feel very comfortable and it's like a natural place for me to be in the water growing, you know, born and raised in Florida and stuff like that. So I tried out for that and, um, I, I did well. And just so happens that the team that was running the pre screw pre scuba, pre scuba, um, that was the paid dive team. So the team, the team sergeant who was there, he's like, Hey, if you make it through, dive school then you have a slot or a spot on on the team and I was like awesome so I have a team if I can just make make it through so I went down to Key West um, that school's is about two months long and did that made it through and I, I got to I, I got to be on a paved dive team so it's pretty cool because in the way the way it used to be is um, there's three 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 companies uh, or three companies in a battalion and there's only one paid uh team in that battalion and i and so i could have went to a team that wasn't paid um so i was i just felt fortunate that i actually ended up on the paid dive team even though it wasn't a whole lot of extra pay it was it was extra pay and at that time you know uh, every every little bit of money helps so it was really cool it's a lot of fun um and then of course being on on a dive team uh, you have to be able to do everything a normal special forces team can, um, can 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 do and trains at, but you have the additional task of also doing you know dragger stuff and any type of what of water ops. So with that meant that when we you know I take a, other trips to where it was like a di- a dive trip, and um, we'd go some off some coast somewhere and we practice infill and we do our deep dives and our dragger dives and so it it, it was a lot of fun. It, it was it was a really good time, um, and the dive teams were typically uh, the team that was the most in shape because we ran all the time. And you know you have to be in really good shape to be on a dive team because if if you think about it, <clears throat> if you're going to do an infill, and let's say you're going to do it over the horizon, you know you, you get you get dropped off, um, you're going to swim in maybe two two miles with equipment and stuff like that. Um, so it's very taxing, it's very physical, but then once you hit the beach, then the mission starts, or you might hit the beach and you might have a couple of mile movement until you hit the target. So you have to be in very, very good shape to be on a dive team. And so I loved it again. It was a great challenge and I always, always love a challenge and, uh, you know, being a young green beret, you know, having that dive status, you know, it was, it was, it was a cool thing. I loved it. How much gun stuff do you guys do there? Is it also? I'm mean, I mean, assume that you gotta yeah. you gotta have that in addition to all this, right? Absolutely. I, um, so we 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 did a fair amount. We um we didn't do a whole lot of pistol shooting though. Um, most most really most every army unit, um, unless you're you know maybe like an MP, um, which is which their primary weapon is a pistol, um, would 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 have a lot of training on on a pistol, but um so we do i mean i would say that you know looking back we 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 did shoot a lot but it wasn't like um a lot of very uh intense um i I don't want to say um a lot of uh i mean because in training like so on the team you know basically everybody is like if, if if i'm new everybody is an instructor so not everybody was a really good shot. And so, you know, you have all this information coming at you and, 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 and I, I became a good shot and we did shoot a lot, shoot a lot, but I felt like, um, it maybe wasn't the best training as far as like looking at all the little details and everything it takes to really have a strong foundation to be a very good shooter. Um, but then there's also other, other, uh, schools with you know being on on a team where like we had um it was called at the time Sa- safartec or no it was safawic okay it was a um a a, a unit level um uh, uh direct action kind of training okay it went on it was, it was probably a, a month long 
and during during that um, you do a lot of flat a lot of flat range shooting you do a lot of carbine shooting a lot of up close shooting um, as you can imagine if you're going in, uh, in into a building or into a room everything is going to be up close so it's a lot of really fast shooting um, and a lot of pistol shooting as well so we did a lot of flat range work um, doing transitions from rifle to pistol doing a lot of pistol work so it was at that time that I got a re- a lot of training doing doing that from instructors that were um, they, they were, they were special forces in, in, in instructors, but they specialized more in shooting. And those were the ones that would go out and get training outside of the military from a professional shooter. And then they would bring that knowledge back. And then they were, in, you know, cause they were now instructors in the military. Um, so that's when I really got, I think, uh, a, 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 a higher level of pistol shooting as well as carbine shooting. So that's interesting. So the military, which I guess it makes sense, right? Because, Competition shooters, their sole focus is how do I do it faster and more accurate? Obviously, they don't have to worry about anybody shooting at them, right? Right. So in the military, there's a whole other layer which the target shoots back. But it is interesting that, and it makes sense again, that the, the military would seek out professional shooters, bring them in, see see what they can learn from them, and then apply it. As, as they see fit. Absolutely. Because if you think about it, if you, if you take someone who focuses only on one thing, okay. Cause shooting is, is even though it's a very important part of being in a direct action unit or, uh, or, or, or having that, that, that skill set, shooting is a very important part, but it's just a small part of that. I mean, there's so much more you have, you have commo training, you have med training, um, you have, um, explosive training, um, you have, uh, um, training on, on vehicles and, and airborne ops. And for us, you know, we also had to be good at water ops as well. So, I mean, you had all this, all this additional training, so you had to be good at a lot of things. Um, so, so getting somebody who their sole focus or sole, uh, sole purpose in life is to be very, very good at shooting. And they're some of the, the world's best. I mean, they're going to, they're going to, they're going to know how to make you a better shooter, even though it's, it's just because it's just that, that one narrow focus, how to shoot better. And so, we understood that. Um, and so we would bring in the best shooters to teach us how to shoot. And then we would take that information and we would apply it, um, to, to how it relates to our, our mission. Okay. Which quite honestly, I mean, like maybe like 98% of how you, how a professional shooter shoots does apply to what we did. Um, the, the, the biggest difference is, is, um, professional shooters don't, don't have to wear full body armor. They don't have to shoot at night under nods. They're not, um, um, obviously they're not getting shot at, but I mean, that's, that's, that's something that our training teaches us to kind of like, um, uh, stress inoculation. So, um, shooting under that type of environment, but, um, yeah, we would just have a, a professional shooter come in and teach us like this is how you shoot fat more fast and more accurate and then we then we just take that and apply it to what we would do and uh, and how we would use it uh, what are the what is the pistol training like or or carbine is it's uh i guess it, it it goes back to what you specialize in i assume there's different different members of the military that specialize like you, you know you were swimming where there's some uh that would specialize in maybe clearing houses and, and some that are doing, uh, you know, obviously snipers and things of that nature. Yes. Um, so the way it used to be set up and I, I, I'm not sure if it, if it's still set up the same way. Um, I, I, I think, it, I think it probably is. Um, so there's also teams that were halo teams. Okay. Cause not everybody in special forces had, um, a halo qualifier, which is uh, high altitude, low, high altitude, low openings where you would, it's basically jumping under a square shoot. You're not jumping out. It's not, it's not a static line. Okay. Um, so that's, that's a whole separate school. So you're either on a halo team or you're on, um, a scuba team, or you could be on a mobility team. Um, there's just different teams. Um, but as far as direct action, in special forces, there's actually, um, a whole separate, uh, battalion that is set up 
for just direct actions. It, was, it used to be called a SIF. I think it's called a CRIF now. Um, and their sole purpose is to be really good at direct action. So most most everything they do is is it it it, it revolves around that. Now all special forces team have some type of training on that. It's just that it's not their special. It's not their specialty. So if you're in um, a CRIF, that means that you're going to do a lot more shooting on the flat range. You're going to do a lot more pistol work. You're going to do a lot more rifle work, and you and you are also going to have uh, uh, embedded snipers as well. So you have people in that unit that are sniper qualified, and they do a lot of a lot of long range shooting as well. Um, but if you're not in that special um, in that special unit within special forces, then you're going to get a little bit of that, and that is that. Cephalic, which is where they take every team will get a chance to go through there so everybody has a, 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 a at least a um a certain level of, of of cqb or direct action training but you say you also had to do a little bit of everything yes yes we were we were jack jack of all trades um you know so under the uh, a lot of what's what special uh, special forces does is foreign internal defense we uh, we learn a language um and and depending on on the group you're in is depending upon what language you learn um so you take that language and the, the whole purpose is that so you can go to a foreign country um you get embedded with um another another foreign unit so obviously with the war i mean it was like going over there working with the afghanis or the iraqis and you would train them up and you would bring them up to a certain level and then we would uh, for for the whole purpose of using them to go into combat with so it wouldn't be it's not a unit it's not a unilateral thing where it's just a, a sf team now some sometimes it is but um the, the 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 biggest mission we had was to go and train up a foreign defense force and get them up to a certain level and then take them into battle that, that was the bread and butter of being a green beret oh okay so you you just help train the the local armies yes so they can so they can do the job if you guys yes. are not around Yes, it's kind of like a it's it's a it's a crawl walk run method. So you you show up. Um, a lot of them, I mean, obviously, they're already soldiers, but they're not trained at the level at, um, in which we are. So we go through a lot of basic stuff because a lot of those four militaries, you don't know what you don't know what you're getting. I mean, you're 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 you're, you're getting people who I mean, they have the desire to fight. I mean, they're definitely want to fight, but they just don't know how to employ tactics very, very well. Okay. It's kind of every man for themselves. There's the bad guy over there. Let's everybody go. You know, so we're, 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 we're teaching them tactics. We're teaching them how to fight as a unit, as, as, um, you know, because I mean, if you learn how to fight as, as, as a unit, you're going to be stronger, you're going to be better. So we're, we're teaching them tactics. And then we, you know, after we train them up, like on, you know, doing the flat range work and practice small, small unit tactics and all that, whenever we feel they're ready, we might do like, it's called a confidence target. So it's something that's easy and we'll go out and we'll, we'll execute a mission. And then if they do well, then we just, you know, we'll go on to the next one. And then eventually they're going to be fighting at a level, which we feel like, you know, they're able to fight on their own. Um, but typically it was always having uh, one of us or a whole team would be embedded with them as they go into combat. Now, at what point are we training the enemy? Mm. Yes, that is something that it was always in, 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 in the back of our minds. Okay. Because, uh, there were, there were times. Um, and actually when I was over there, uh, in 2004, 2005, um, yeah, we had, uh, a, um, a, a, a Taliban implant in the force that we were training and he decided to get up in the middle of the night while all his buddies and soldiers were sleeping and start shooting everybody yeah so I mean it was it, it was very real I mean I mean I've, I'm sure you've heard it on the news you've heard other people talk about it it's 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 unfortunate you know and it's it's kind of it's stre it's very stressful because you're with these guys and now hey I'm not I'm not saying, I mean, it, it is a possibility, but on the, on the flip side of that, there was also, I mean, amazing soldiers that 
absolutely were 100% loyal, uh, great fighters, and, they, and you knew that they had your back. But you just, you never really knew, you know, and, and, and especially if you're going in and, and if it's a new unit and you haven't worked with them a whole lot, you don't, you, you don't really know. Okay. But then, but through time, then you develop trust and stuff like that. But yes, it is something. And then, and you don't know, I mean, like, unfortunately, um, you know, the U S like we, we were over in Iraq and then we pulled out and, then, uh, you know, in the very first Gulf war, you know, we, we were there, we, we, we helped out and then we left and we left people hanging. And unfortunately, the U.S. has um, ha- has a history of doing that. Um, so you, you, you just don't know. And so a lot of them, um, they have to do what they have to do to protect themselves and their families. So if we're not there and they have to go somewhere else and take allegiance to another group in order to stay alive and for their families to stay alive, then you don't know. I mean, yes, there is a chance that someone that you trained up you might have to fight again uh, another day. I mean, it, it, it's 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 not super rare, but it's not it's it's not it's not very very common, but it does happen. Man, that's going to be tough to uh, to have a situation like that because then what do, you know? Where do you go from there, right? How do you you know once that happens, like the guy that kind of went you know crazy on you guys or on 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 his teammates? How do you know there's not more? You know what I'm saying? Well. You, you don't, it's not, it's, you're never a hundred percent, but there are ways of doing, you know, obviously we, we already had a level of background checks and stuff like that. I mean, we have, we, 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 we had a process, um, but, but like any process, it's not a hundred percent. Nothing is guaranteed. Um, so, you know, it's just, you, you do your best and you just accept that there is that chance that it, it could happen. And I, I get it. You know, you guys are doing it for a greater good and, and you just have to take those risks and, and accept them because otherwise nobody would help anybody. Right. If that was the because uh, that's like you said, that's always a possibility. So, mm-hmm. you know, I, I, yeah. it's tough, but I get it. It, it is tough. But it, but it, but if, if you think about it, OK, if if our country was being invaded by another country, OK, and we were at war in our country and then a superpower came in and said hey we're going to help you fight this enemy that came into your land and has taken over so the people who fight the hardest are the people that have the most to lose okay so it's their own country so they're going to fight the hardest now the biggest difference about overseas is that they didn't really have a um a loyalty to the country like they don't have a loyalty a loyalty to the country of say afghanistan or iraq it's a loyalty to their 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 um their religion or their 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 secular beliefs okay if you know you had you know this the shia the sunnis and stuff like that you have i mean there's just so many different types of of or 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 um i guess secular divisions in there as far as like religious beliefs and stuff like that and they have been fighting for thousands of years okay so and then you know it, i don't know so it, it if, if you think about it in in the terms of that like if if i had somebody coming here to help me fight on my soil i would i would fight very hard because it's my country it's what i believe in um so it works both ways okay it's just that over there it's just a lot more complex because you're dealing with religions and ideologies and stuff like that and it's just not as black and white it's not like hey you're an afghani so you're going to fight hard for afghanistan because there's different groups within afghanistan large groups that take control and so it's, it's just it's complicated so you guys train these people up and you know you kind of get them prepared at what point do you just say okay you're on your own well, it's like I said, it's a, it's a, it's a crawl, walk, run. So at some point, if we feel like they're able to, because it's not only just about training the guys on, on the ground, how to shoot, move and communicate, but it's also, um, our officers would work with their officers and teach them how to lead their men, how to use assets and stuff like that. So whenever we come together co- collectively as a team and say, Hey, we, we think these, these guys are ready to go, then, you know, we might let them go off and do something on their own, you know, but, um, mm-hmm. but I, I personally have never, um, I have never trained up a unit to where 
we, we, we said, Hey, they're ready to go on their own. Um, my experience in, in, in group was we were always at that level where we're training them and we're going into combat with them, but we never said, Hey, you guys are ready to go. You're blessed off on, and you're going to go do great things on your own. And you're just going to go out and do ops on your own. Um, because again, it's like in order for them to succeed, they would have to, to use our assets as well. So th with the language barrier and stuff like that, I mean, if we're, if it's close, close air support or if, or if they need a medevac, they still need an American on the ground with them to help manage the assets. Okay. So, the, so they can use them at their disposal and gain the advantage. Did you guys have any close calls with some of these uh, ops that you took these people on? Uh, I personally did not. Um, we had there were there, there 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 was this one op where, uh, and this is something that actually was uh, I was actually very concerned with was not necessarily someone who was purposely trying to kill you that you were training, but an accidental discharge or a negligent discharge because that happened all the time because they didn't they didn't have the level of training and their gun handling skills was not quite up to par a lot of times and it was very common for somebody I mean I, relatively common for one of the soldiers to have an accidental discharge. And so we were moving through moving through a village and the guy behind me his gun his gun went off and and you know I immediately turned around like am I going to have to blast this guy is he shoot is is he shooting at us but of course he wasn't it was just an AD um and I was also training some 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 folks um on another you know, another time and we were on the range and he had an AD and it was right there in front of my, in front of my foot. So, mm. you know, it's, it's, it's dangerous business, whether they are trying to kill you or whether it's accidental. I mean, there's, it, there's always a level of, uh, of danger there for that. Yeah. The bullet doesn't know the difference. The bullet doesn't know the difference. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Man, that's, uh, yeah, I figured maybe they, uh, they were not as, uh, you know, their trigger discipline, maybe not as good as y'all's. Yeah, definitely but. not. <laughs> definitely not. <laughs> So, you know, I mean, so, oh, you know, you see, obviously I have, listen, man, I'm, I have zero experience and, and I, I actually feel lucky that I, that I don't honestly. Right. And for that, I thank you and, and, you know, everyone else that like you. So, uh, my respect for sure. Thank However, you. these are things that I wonder. It's like, you know, you, you know, even like you said, even a friendly could take you out of the fight at any time. You know, just, I, you know, I don't know. I guess, I guess, how scared are you when you're out there? Uh, how do you manage that? The, the, the fear thing is completely, I, I would say every individual has their own way of dealing with, with, with fear. Okay. Um, absolutely. I was scared at times. I mean, and if anybody says they were never scared, then they would have to be a psychopath or something like that because it's going to happen. And it, but it's okay. Okay. Because, you know, you can't have courage without fear. Okay. So you have to be able to have fear and still be able to do your job and operate at a high level. Um, so, and it's, it's like a, for me, it was, um, uh, an evolution. Like, the first time that I was in a combat zone and the first time that I, 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 I had seen combat um, and then leading up to that, I mean, there was a level of fear because when we got to Afghanistan for, for, for the first time, our unit at the, at the end of that trip, it was a nine, a nine month trip. Uh, I believe we'd lost seven people. Okay. So, so you're there on a base, you're training these guys up you're going out doing missions and then you're getting the news that one of your uh, buddies from another team was killed. All right. So it does play on your psyche. Absolutely. At that time, that was probably when I was the most fearful. Okay. Because it was the first time I was in a combat zone and I didn't know how to manage that. Um, I think it was just through self-preservation. I mean, yes, I had people talk to me about it and, uh, I had some good advice on how to, on how to deal with it. A lot of guys, um, they turned to religion, you know, and, and, and they, they put everything into the hands of God and that is awesome. Okay. Um, 
but for me, um, because I'm not a very religious person, and, and 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 trust me, I've talked to God. You know, we've we we have a relationship. Um, but for me, it was more. Uh, I guess it's more of a of a um, of a universal th- or uh, a universe thing or a training thing. It's like, hey, if if I train is hard when I'm back home and I'm in, I'm back in the rear. If I'm training hard, if I'm doing everything I'm supposed to do, I'm not cheating when I'm doing my PT. I mean, when I'm on the flat range, I'm maximizing every moment. If I'm, and, and, and the, and the guys around me are some of the best trained in the world. If we're training hard, um, and I'm not, and I know in my heart, I'm doing everything I can to be prepared for combat. I'm talking about not only in my training, but my equipment, um, all, all the all, 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 all the skill sets that I'm supposed to have if I'm if I'm boned up on all my commo stuff and we're all boned up on our on our on our uh, medical training and stuff like that I'm, I am the best that I can be and then if I'm that person if I have confidence that I've done everything that I can when I go over into a combat zone that's all you can do because once you get there it to me it's out of your hands okay because guys that were faster than me, stronger than me, smarter than me, better than me in every single way, died. Okay. So that tells me right then and there, um, it's not just skill. Unfortunately, um, it's just, it's just the nature of the beast. Some people make it and some people don't. So I accepted that. Okay. And I knew that the best that I could do is, is, is to be the best that I can be train hard with the best guys all around me have the best assets all that is in my favor so after that I just knew that it was out of my hands so I learned to not even think about it okay because I knew that I was trained I knew I was ready to go and if something happened it was out it was out of my hands so I don't know it's just something that I've I learned to deal with and um and it worked you know I just I I think I think you know um you know I had eight eight tours so you know i was over there enough to where it was more of it was almost like it was, it was a habit i mean we were on a rotation so we were you know we'd come back we'd spend we'd spend time with our family we'd train 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 we'd work out we'd train 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 and then we're back over there um so i felt confident that i had the skills and the people around me had the skills to be successful and win in combat but there's, you know, when bullets are flying, I mean, all it takes is being un- unlucky. You know, you're being in, you're in, you're in the wrong place at the wrong time. It's, it, it, it's, it's going to, it's going to happen. It's the nature of war. You know, people on both sides die. Um, so for me, I just accepted that and I, and, and I learned to not think about it. I did not think about dying instead. And this is from like reading books and stuff like that and listening to um, mo- motivational speakers that talk to professional athletes and stuff like like ta- like tapes on that. And one of the things that they all say is, is um, if you're thinking about something positive, then something positive is likely to happen. If you're thinking about something negative, then something negative is, is likely to happen. So I wanted to project or have this, this, this energy in me that was a positive energy energy it was me winning all the time so i don't want to think about oh my gosh i could get shot in the head all right because now i'm thinking about getting shot in the head or shot you know because it was that's one of the biggest fears i had was getting shot was was getting shot in the head or losing my arms um so i know it's weird right but that's always the thing so i don't think about that it's like instead i think about winning 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 i'm gonna I'm going to hit the ground running. I'm going to run to the target. I'm going to, I'm going to see everything. You know, I'm going to see the bad guy before he sees me. I'm going to I'm gonna take the perfect shot on him. I'm not, I'm not going to miss. I never thought about missing. I always thought about hitting. Um, so it's just, it's, it's like a mindset. It's just a winning mindset. Always think about winning. Never think about losing because again, it's out of your hands. So if you're going to go in there and you're trained and you're ready to go, why, why, why take negative energy in there with you? Why think about something that is negative? Think about you losing. Nope. It's all positive and it's all winning. And that seemed to help me out a lot. I mean, it, it, it gave me the courage to go forward. It gave me the courage to, um, to, uh, squash any fear that I had. Uh, and, and Hey, even, even, even later on in my career, like a matter of fact, it was, I think it was my last deployment, 
is either my last or second to the last, but um, we were in a, in a, in a sticky situation. Um, one of our teammates was uh, killed um, and we didn't know where the guy was at. And, you know, he was buried somewhere in, in some rocks in, in the mountains in a fighting position and he could see us, but we couldn't see him. And that is a scary feeling because we were all looking, you know, and we're dealing with our buddy who was, who was killed. Um, and at the same time, we're, st- we're still, we're still taking fire. And it's like where, you know, where, and it's like, that is, that is the most, I can't imagine a more, um, a more fearful situation than to know that somebody can see you, he can kill you. You can't see him. Therefore you can't kill him. I mean, and that's, that, that, that's where, that, that, that's where snipers are so lethal um, and so effective because it's, it's a, it's, it's a psyche thing, right? If somebody, if you have a unit running through, um, you know, going through a village or, or a town or a city and you have this person somewhere in all these buildings somewhere, you don't see him and he's able to take you out. I mean, it really plays on your psyche. It's, 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 it's very effective in that, in, in that sense as well. So, um, yeah, so I, I mean, on that day I, I, I had fear and, um, it was just the fear of not being able to get rid of this guy. So even then I had to go, okay, I'm scared, but I'm going to fight through it. I'm going to do my job. I'm going to do, I'm going to do the best I can. Um, and that's all, that's all you can do. I assume you guys found him. Uh, we did not find him at that moment. Um, mm-hmm. we were told, uh, we had, we actually X filled out and, um, later on that night, another unit was, uh, was sent in and we were told that they did find him eventually. So, yeah. Again, just me sitting here thinking, okay, you guys found him. Well, how do you know it was only one, right? Exactly. And it's and exactly. there's not only you don't one, know. Right? <laughs> you don't know. I mean, on, 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 on that day, we had bombed the crap out of this valley. Okay, I'm talking just bomb the crap out of it, you know, and they were as there was reportedly, you know, like hundred and ninety dead in enemy there and we were going through to assess the damage and to see who was all in there and looking for any kind of any H H V Ts or anything like that. So in the course of doing that, of course, we did run into others that were still alive. And then as we're going through, we're seeing these fighting positions and they're like, they are dug in, they're up in, they're up in the rocks, they're in the trees. And I mean, they have a defensive position and you're offensively moving through. So you don't have that advantage. Um, and it's, it's, you know, bomb in an area it's, it's deceiving because if you're watching it from like ISR footage, you're going, man, no one can survive that. Look at that destruction. But explosions are really weird. I mean, you can see all that, you know, all the bombs going off, all the explosions. You're like, no way. Well, there's a good chance the way like just the blast waves and stuff like that. Someone could have been in one of those fighting positions behind a rock or something like that. And just, it just, they just so happen to survive. It's weird. It's like, it's like, it's like a tornado, you know, it, go, it, 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 it goes through a, a, a neighborhood and it flattens everything, but there's one house for whatever reason, the tornado went right over it or right beside it. But for whatever reason, that one house is still there and it just defies logic. It's kind of the same way you're bombing, bombing, bombing. And you think, yeah, there's no way. And, but you never think like that. You're like, nope, there's gotta be someone still out there. You, you, you can never think, yep, it's all good. I'm just here. I'm checking a block. We're going to go through. This is easy breezy. You never think that way. You always think that the worst could happen and you prepare for the worst every time. You know, I had a green beret tell me that, uh, firefights are actually kind of fun. This is, this, these are his words. He goes, you know, everybody thinks firefights suck. He goes, they're actually kind of fun. He goes, until we start losing, then they kind of really suck. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, um, it's true. It's yeah. True. I, I wanted to get your, your perspective on that. Yeah. It's, uh, I mean, it's, it sounds weird. I know it's, it's very, cause everybody wants, wants to say that, you know, I mean, cause, Again, everybody has a different a different experience. Um, but for 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 me, same thing. I enjoyed it. I mean, it was. I don't know how to explain it. It, may, it makes me sound crazy, but I, I had a, I enjoyed it. 
I enjoyed every bit of it. You know, I like to say it was the best of times and it was the worst of times, you know, whenever you lose a buddy or teammate, um, yeah, man, it, it, it is devastating. Um, but again, you can't get focused on that. Okay. Because that guy was, was like me. I mean, he wanted to be there. He loved the fight. He loved, and, and he knew going into there that there was a chance that he would die. Just like I know that there's a chance that I'm going to die. So I know that he would not want us to, to mourn and to make it or, or to let his death affect us. Just like if I was to die, I wouldn't want it to affect any, any one of my teammates, you know? So, you know, you just kind of, it's just how you look at things. You have to put things into a different perspective. And most people who are, who are not going in into combat, they, they, they never really have to deal with that or, you know, um, it's just something that, you know, luckily you don't have to think about, you know, but again, being there, having to do that, you learn, you just learn to deal with it. Okay. And if you don't, it'll crush you. It'll, 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 it's just, if you can't, then, I mean, imagine this, imagine going into combat every single time you go into combat, you're scared shitless. Imagine that. I mean, dealing with that, and, and it's just this, this this lurking thing that's always in you, like, I'm scared, I'm scared, I'm scared. I mean, I couldn't imagine that. You have to learn how to manage that. Um, and it's just a lot of times, it's just, um, it, it's, it's having, it's having, you know, a lot of times, it's, it's just, it's a pre-made decision, okay? If I'm going to go in here, and if, if I'm going, or when I go on this mission, if this happens, I'm going to do this, okay? If, if, it's just, it's something that you, you already think about and you already have a plan for. You think that it could happen, but you already in your mind know how you're going to react to that. Um, so then when it happens, you're not surprised and you already have a plan in your mind, how you're going to, how you're going to execute after that. Um, and again, that's, that's, that's just part of the, um, it's part of the whole, uh, the whole psychology of it all. You just have to have a plan and you have to be ready for it ready for the worst okay yeah and, and the, the the biggest thing too is just what what you never want to do is be that person who 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 um who has a cowardice act all right okay so you know imagine if you know just imagine you're in, you're in a gunfight you're in an ambush shit's bad people are around you are getting shot um and then someone lets fear overcome them and then they just freeze and then they hide somewhere. Maybe they go behind a rock or maybe they hide behind the Humvee or something and they're just sitting there and they're just like frozen. Okay. That person was not mentally prepared. He wasn't ready for what could happen on that day. So and the last thing you want to do is let your teammates down because the one fear that I always had was doing something that was going to get a teammate killed. Okay. Obviously it wouldn't be on purpose, but just do making a mistake that's going to get a teammate killed. Cause then I would have to live with that for the rest of my life. And then that, and, and knowing that that, 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 that guy is no longer there to be with his family and to be with his wife and kids and stuff like that. Like it just is the one thing. So I always knew like, no matter what, I don't care how, how bad it gets. Like I'm going to keep fighting, um, because I had I already had that in my mind. Like, I'm not going to let my teammate down ever. I, I might let myself down, but I'm never going to, never going to let a teammate down. Um, so it just takes a little bit of thought, um, to, to prepare yourself for that all the time. But again, if you're doing it all, all, you know, all the time, you have that opportunity to practice that and to become proficient with your positive mindset or what, or whatever it is. I mean, it's like I said, it's, a lot of people turn to God and they put it in his hands and Hey, that's a very, very powerful thing. And, and it works for a lot of people. So like I said, everybody has their, their own, their own way of dealing with that. Yeah. So that's the mental aspect. Obviously it's very similar to what you have to do in shooting sports, but obviously multiply times, whatever, you know, to be able to handle the added stress of, like you said, you know, not letting a teammate down, being shot at, going into the unknown, hoping that you're prepared enough to what for whatever's come. Because that's the thing, right? You you guys prepare, 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 but you just never know precisely what you're preparing for. 
That's, right, right. That's the, the the scary part. Yeah, I mean, you you you, you kind of have an idea, all right? You know, you know that you know you, you kind of have an idea if you're going to go do a hit somewhere. You know, you, well, you know they're going to be shooting at you. you know, they're they're going to be expecting you. You don't know if they're going to place IEDs or booby traps or something like that along the way, that's the unknown, you know, you can, you expect that you like, yeah, it could happen, you know, but it, it, it goes back to like, 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 like I said, my biggest fear was letting a teammate down. Okay. So I made sure that everything, uh, everything I did was not going to do that, you know? So I trained harder. I took it serious. You know, I didn't, I did I, I, I never slacked it, you know, in, in, in that in that category, whether it's on the flat range, whether it was in 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 the gym, um, in any 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 of my training, I mean, I took it serious, okay, and I gave it a hundred a hundred percent all the time. So I knew in my heart that I was doing everything I I that I could do. Because um, if you think about it, right? If you think about a cowardice act, what is a cowardice act? It's a it's 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 extreme uh, selfishness. Okay, it's that person saying, hey, my life is more important than yours. I want to go over here and find safety somewhere else. It could be perceived safety, but in their mind, they're finding safety so they can stay alive, so they don't get hurt. Okay, meanwhile, everybody else is out there hanging it on the line. Okay, so it's very selfish. All right, so, you know, that's why, you know, it's it's one of those things that, Everybody knows what to expect. Everybody, that at least the people that I've I've I went to combat with, were prepared for. And I had no like I never had any reservations about anybody to my left and right ever, um, because I just knew the um, caliber of men they were. They were warriors. They trained hard. We were the best of the best. And so I had that. I took that confidence into combat with me. Um, so it's just, uh, yeah, that's why it's one of the things that when somebody does that, um, you can never come back from that. Okay. Because you're, you literally said that your life is more important than mine. Your family is more important than my family. Um, and it's something that no one can ever, ever come back from. Yeah. That, that's a tough one, man. Did you ever run into a complete, oh shit, I never expected this to happen type of thing i can't think i ever no i can't think of anything that totally i mean i've seen things that i was like oh my god i can't believe i just saw that because it was so strange and so weird and at the time you're like it's like i don't know it's um you, you see some pretty uh disgusting gross horrific things in combat um, because explosions and mortars and missiles and bombs, they do, they can wreak havoc as well as bullets as well, just like out of, out of a gun, depending on where someone's shot and stuff like that. But so I have seen the effects of ordnance, <laughs> I guess you say, which is like, took me back. Like, wow, I've never seen a human body like that before, you know? Um, but as far as like seeing something, as far as uh, I don't know that I wasn't prepared for, or I wasn't uh, that I didn't think about could happen, I don't think I've ever seen anything that just kind of took me back. But 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 yeah, the 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 the, the effects of war and like what you see, I have seen things that I was like, I can't believe I just saw that. Yeah. So you know, you're you're uh, you're at war for 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 a while, right? You said eight tours. Is that what you had? Mm-hmm. How do you come back and and blend back into civilization as we know it? Is that yeah. tough to do? That's it's that that's kind of a tough one because, um, for me, I don't know. I think it, I I I was fortunate that the integration back into my family was relatively easy. Um, now, I'm not saying um, there wasn't uh, a transition period, like a couple of days where I'm like, I was overwhelmed. Like, 
example. Um, I got back, I mean, literally, we did a mission in a firefight. We get back, um, I'm, and we're leaving, like, the next day, okay? So, we're, we're, it was our last mission. We're packing up everything. We're leaving back to the States. Another unit's coming to replace us. And within, like, a, a, a two days or something, like, because of flight time and everything like that, um, like, within, like, two days or three days, I'm literally, like, I was sitting on my couch in my house. And, of course, my kids are excited to see me. So my daughters are, like, they're just, and it's they're just like, daddy, daddy, this and that and that. And that was, it was just this one time. I, I, I just, like, I don't, I don't even know. I don't even know how to explain it. I was just overwhelmed with the amount of noise and chatter in this, this, this person, my daughter, on my lap and, and went, you know, just all over me. And it was weird. I just picked her up. I set her down and I walked outside. I'm like, oh, man, I was like, what's going on, man? Like, what? Why do I feel like this? Like, this is really strange. Like, I was like, it was too much, which is strange, right? Because I just, I just got out of combat. Like, that should be stressful. That should be what, like, affects me. But coming back was just too much. I don't know how to explain it. So I went out. I went outside. I walked around. I was like, okay, I'm good. I'm good. I took a deep breath. I'm like, all right, it's my daughter. You know, I got to go in there you know, to hug her and stuff, and like, hey, it's all cool, you know, it's like, you know, I missed you, and all this stuff, so I, I, I don't know why it, why I did that, and it was just that one time that kind of just stuck out, um, but for the most part, yeah, I, I'd get back, it was, I mean, I, the, 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 the other thing now that was kind of weird is everywhere I went, I felt like I was forgetting something, and it's because I didn't have my gun with me, because overseas, you everywhere you go, you have a gun with you. You know, it's like you're always on. You're always um, somewhat alert. You know, you're always looking, and, and 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 you can never fully relax. I mean, if you're outside the wire, you know, you can never do that. But you always have your gun with you. And then I just remember having this this constant feeling of like I'm missing something. There, there's something out there, and it, it took a it took a couple of days. And I'm like, why do I feel like this? And it's because, oh, it's because I don't have my gun with me right now. I don't have my rifle with me. It's not, it's not right there, you know. It's not within an arm's reach, you know. It was kind of weird. Yeah, it's just kind of interesting. But, I mean, for, for, for me, it wasn't too bad. Um, I, again, for everybody, it's, it's, it's different. I can see how that could uh, be tough to uh, integrate back into, you know, what we do. You know, like, you know, it's it's... I can't even imagine how different it is, but I, I can, I can see how it could be very different. I mean, obviously it's very different. You know, I, I, I literally have no idea how different it is. This, this is why I'm kind of tripping over my own words because, but I can, you know, like, you know, some minor, I'm just, just minor example. I was in South Africa for almost a month. Just from there, obviously I was not in combat or anything, but I was just shooting for a month, right? And it just being in a different place for that long. And obviously the routine was different, right? It's get up in the morning, go to the range, get, you know, compete all day, go home, you know, go back to the hotel, clean the rifles, yes. see bullets. It just, it was all shooting related. Then I come back and it took me a few days yeah. just to get back into the routine because it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's different. Right. It is exactly. It's a, it's the same thing. Okay. It's like when you're overseas in a combat zone, your whole, you know, every, the whole purpose of you being there is for the mission, right? The mission is to go kill or capture bad guys. Okay. If that's the mission. But for us, that was primarily the whole purpose of going over there was to capture or kill bad guys. Okay. So everything you do revolves around that. And in some ways, life is simple then you don't you're not worried about the bills you're not worried about picking up your daughter from school you're not worried about mowing the grass you're not worried about you know uh making sure the wife is happy and 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 spending time with her you know there's there's so many like to me like normal life was was always harder okay because there's just it's just it's, there's so many little things you're not narrowly focused on one thing but over there it's, it's like you have this, it's, it, it is, it's, it's a routine. We would, we would, you know, study, um, Intel, 
the reports and stuff like that, we would we would have um, our target deck, and we're like, hey, we have these people. We're going after these people. Okay, so where are they at? And we had our process of finding them and 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 following them, and, you know, and, and stuff like that. And then when we knew where they were at, we're like, okay. Now we know what we're going to do because we do this every single time. I mean, it might change up a little bit the mode of infill. You might you might land far away and walk in for a couple hours, so you know you un, under the cover of darkness, so you don't alert them. Or you might land really close to them where you're running from, like right out of the bird and hitting a house or something like that. So the mode of of, of doing it could change a little bit, but it, it was generally the same thing over and over and over again. And you're just hyper focused, and it and 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 being in special operation units like they purposely take a lot of stuff off the table for you so your mind can stay clear and focused it's just like prior to going over there i mean there's so many things you do you make sure your 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 will is in order um there's a really good um support group for your family and your wife and and you just you know everything is taken care of for you and they and they and they do that on purpose they say because they want you once you leave you're not thinking about your family you're not or i should say you're not worried about them okay because they are being taken care of so you can focus on the task at hand which is to do your mission um so yeah i mean to your point like you you were you were super focused on winning the worlds right you wanted to, i mean you had your, you, you know and it's just and it was everything you love to do okay because when you're back home and you're not shooting like everything you do when you wake up and you go to bed is about winning the world it's like it's about shooting it's like everything that's easy because it's what you want to do and, and you love it so it's not even like like work really because it's what you love but then you come back home and then you got all this external stuff. You got to be here. You got this appointment. You got this, this bills, all you got all this other stuff. And you don't necessarily love that. You know, you do it because it's part of life. You know, it's part of living. You have to do it. Um, but it's not narrowly focused and it's not what you love. So, yeah, I mean, that is, it, it, again, it's easier. To me, it was easier. Being overseas in Comet was much easier than day-to-day life. And, 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 it, and it still is. I mean, life is tough. I mean, it's just, you don't, there's just so many variables. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's just, and that's, that's why I think a lot of, a lot of soldiers, when they get out of the army and they stop going overseas and they stop fighting, even though it does cause scars mentally, emotionally, and physically scars in your body, it was, it's still something that, most soldiers miss and love and then then they come back to the real world and there is a hard time to adapt you know um it's just you know overall like the whole like managing just managing life it's always been difficult for me um and i don't know why i don't know why why that is i don't know if it's because um you know i i i i miss what i used to do i don't know if it's because i'm not part of this you know, a team that's really tight and we're always together and we're always supporting. I don't know. I, I, I really don't know. But that's why I think a lot of soldiers struggle with that because it is harder. Um, and that that's that's where soldiers can get in trouble, you know, um, drinking drugs and um, other activities that are, are dangerous and stuff like that. It's just it's their way of, um, of, of I guess, uh, because they can't manage and deal they find another outlet yeah i think i think what happens is we have we don't have that focus and like you said bills and you know cutting the grass and and (laughs) painting the house and and, you know hanging up christmas lights and things of that nature they just don't give you that immediate feedback of accomplishment you know what i mean it's it's, it is a very long-term uh mission i guess you can call it but it's not immediate. So that's why, you know, in construction, I, I love construction. I was in construction for a long time, but I loved being uh, a concrete contractor because we'd start a job and we'd do all this work. And then in one day, you pour concrete in one day, it doesn't matter the size, damn near. I mean, you at some point you split it mm-hmm. up, but if it's one, you get it done in that one day. So mm-hmm. all of a sudden in one day, I loved poor days because that's when <laughs> in one day you got so much done. You, you know? see the results. You it's see the results of your like work. Like that. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
And when I was doing, I finally eventually got into a home building and, you know, with building an entire home was not as, it was very satisfying when it was done, but it was always mm-hmm. seemed like it just, it was never yeah. over. Right. You just got to keep going. Got to keep going. Got to keep going. Yeah. And, that's a very good point. Uh, very good but point. anyway, it's just, I, I, I think it's that immediate, and maybe not immediate, but a very fast feedback of accomplishment. Of, mm-hmm. We got it done. Here's yes. the mission. Go, and the mission's done, and move on to the next thing. Right? Yes. Yes. I don't exactly. know. I, I'm assuming. No. That's, no. It's it. That's that. I think that's a very. I think it's a, that's a very good point. I think it's a very good point. Well, you got to go show me how to shoot an AR now that I have one because I got that that stag arms. So. Yeah, AR. definitely. I I tell you, um, one of these days, I, I would love to just spend some time with you on the range um i i i I, like i mentioned to you before i really want to get into the the long range game nrl uh, hunter mat matches and some prs matches and stuff like Mm -hmm. that i i I don't know i just like i I was telling you i got this this urge to to just i don't know to just shoot more of the long range game i mean um i've always been uh i mean i love pistol pistols has always been my favorite um weapon of choice and it's just something i've always loved to shoot um and i still do but i've never had a desire to be like this 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 long-range shooter until lately and i, I don't i can't explain it it's but, fun um, man those I'm nrl matches and those prs matches they're 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 a lot of fun i'm actually gonna go shoot one this weekend i'm kind of taking yeah. a little hiatus from f class for about three months before i get back into shooting mm-hmm. big matches again and i'm gonna go shoot some prs it's it's fun it's a it's a nice relief for me it's still shooting but it's different so right. it so feels like it something. feels fun yeah it's it's mm-hmm. it's fun and it's just i don't care how i do and right that's you know talk about stress relievers for me f class is stressful because it it matters how i do i'm there to win mm-hmm. when i go shoot prs i'm there just to shoot mm-hmm. i don't care how i end up you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And I'm just there to bullshit with people and just have fun and, mm-hmm. you know, whatever. So that's, that's fun to me. But now, now do you, do you think shooting PRS or uh, NRL is going to make you a better F class shooter? I mean, are, are there aspects yes, of that shooting? Anything, that's anytime over? you shoot something different than, than, than what you do, you're going to learn something mm-hmm. you're going to, and you're going to find a way to apply it. Right. You know, for example, uh, you know, in F class, we have a big target, and yeah, the way I used to do F class is I'd write down my zeros for a thousand yards or five hundred, you know, six hundred yards, and I'd have it. And if I was an um, MOA high or MOA low or two MOA, it didn't matter because I just click it, click it in until I was centered up, and then I'd go for record. Mm-hmm. But uh, you know, when when we shoot world championship or you know even overseas, when when they do a pair fire, so you only get two siders. Mm-hmm. So then I started doing more like a PRS shooter would do where I have a ballistic app and I'd keep track of my density altitude and my, and I, I went and chewed up my F class rifle so I can have the correct trajectory and things of that nature. So when I was down in South Africa, I, instead of having, you know, absolute values for my come ups, I had actual, uh, ballistic data, ballistic app. Mm-hmm. And I'd pull it up and uh, get my density altitude. And, and you know, I converted most of my side because I was, I was in the center most of the time. So I learned that from PRS, you know. Ah. So I'm applying it to F-class now. Ah, that's the very the good. fact that I can be, and as the day went on, density altitude would change. And if it was different from one, one day to the other, then I knew that my zero that I had at 1,000 yards from previous day was not going to be valid on the second day, you know, maybe mm-hmm. after lunch or right. so anyway, so all those things I learned from F, I mean, from PRS and I'm applying them to F class. And there's a lot, obviously that I learned in F class. And when I shoot PRS, I apply that there, which mm-hmm. uh, helps me. It just makes you a better shooter all around to right. try different things. And just, just like the whole pistol thing, you know, mm-hmm. I'm going to do more pistol and ARs and I'm going to start doing more of everything cuz it it's always I want to go shoot a two gun match. I was talking mm-hmm. to Nils and he's like, "Oh dude, you got to do a two gun match." So oh, yeah. You know, you things have to of that do nature. That. Yeah, yeah, that's that that's going to be fun. Just I I'm I'm curious from 
with with a change in density altitude now i know depending on how much it changes obviously it's going to affect the the impact of the bullet but how much does that affect it like if because it amazes me is like how accurate the algorithm is on on these shooting apps i mean they're they're pretty dang close but i've never i've never shot to where i mean like fractions of an inch matter you know it's always like hey well, it's, it's good not, in, it's, it's good not in fractions it. of an inch when when you're doing the uh the uh for example you know i have i'm gonna pull up a thousand yards and uh my density altitude i'm gonna go to zero okay okay and uh my come up is 8.6 mils on this on this cartridge that i just happen to have selected okay 8.6 mils okay now i'm gonna go to uh uh 5000 da okay and now it's 8.1. So that's half mil. Wow. Different. That's 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 uh, significant. Yes. Now it's 5,000 DA. It may sound extreme, but it's not. Right. Like, you go to Phoenix or Raton or one of them places, it may swing three to 4,000 in one day. So, mm. you know, it, not only that, you know, let, let's say you get a cold front, uh, you know, one day you get a cold front, you're shooting then, then the next day, like you're in here in Texas, you know, and one day's, you know, it's, uh, you get a cold front, it's 75 degrees or something. And the next day it's 105. Mm -hmm. Your, your elevation just changed by half mil or more at a thousand yards, which is yeah. the difference between a hit or a miss. Absolutely. Easily. So Absolutely. yeah. And that's just density altitude, right? Right. Um, uh, you know, obviously once if, if it's going to be 4,500, it's more likely going to be hot. You're going to have a lot of mirage from target. So everything just kind of goes to hell. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's that's why I want to get on the range with you. So maybe one day we'll have an opportunity where I can take you to the flat range and we can do some carving stuff and I can show you a, a few things that you might not have heard of before, maybe. You oh, know, dude, but, I'm, um, you, you had me at flat range. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I can definitely help you out there, uh, but then we can move over to a long range. And I mean, there's just like literally I'm, I'm thinking of like a hundred questions now. Um, oh yeah. No, so there's, there's I, a lot I, there and there, yeah. trust me, there's a lot more there than I know, but these are some of the things that I've learned yeah. from shooting PRS for a while mm -hmm. that I have transferred over to F glass and they've helped me tremendously. I mean, yeah. I'm, you saw me there at the, uh, the uh, rock trick olympic i'm the other one with the kestrel in my pocket yeah. <laughs> and I'm, I'm i'm taking all these readings and because that's what i was doing right. and uh, right. and that's what allowed me to shoot hit those long range shots yeah because you know i'm you know you saw even that ar i was dialing it yeah you're dialing you know? it up yeah and uh i was taking my time to dial because i had i had the come-ups and uh it's it helps it's just one less thing to think about when you're shooting right right, right. and right. uh but anyway, it it's all it just makes you a better shooter. Just just like yeah. you were talking about how when you're in special ops you have all these other things that they make you do, like swim and run and, and all these other things and, and you know, jump out of planes and, and, and you mm -hmm. know, go into you know, houses and all that stuff, right? Mm -hmm. It just makes you a better soldier. Yeah. It does. It does. And that, that's why, like, there, there's a lot of drills that I see, or I, I've done as well, but there's a lot of drills that, you know, switching shoulders and stuff like that as you're shooting because you're on the left side. Like, if I'm right, right handed, but if I'm shooting off the left side of a barricade or something, and, you know, there's there, there's a, a method of, of switching hands, you know, to get that so you're not exposing your, your, your yourself as much. And, um, I mean, I don't, I've never done that and I don't think it's a good idea, but, I still, I trained it because yeah. it's just manipulating the gun. It's doing something completely different. It's just, it's just getting familiar and getting good with moving the gun in weird places and shooting from uh, my, you know, shooting with my left eye versus my right eye. Shooting. And it's not like I, I, I honestly, I could, I would never recommend anybody doing that. Um, but in, like in combat or in it, or certainly not in a house. Okay. Like switching sides to, pie a door or something i think that is just ridiculous okay and i don't know of anybody who's ever done that that i've ever deployed with um however 
it is kind of cool to do it because it just breaks that mold. It's just getting you comfortable with moving the gun and manipulating the gun and just, it's, it's unfamiliar. So you're teaching your, 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 your brain how to do that. So then when you go back to something that's relatively normal, you know, that you do all the time, it actually is a little bit easier. So it, yeah, it's, it's interesting. Yeah. I mean, Absolutely. it's, 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 uh, PRS, you're going to enjoy it. It's, it's, I enjoy it. It's fun. It's just, yeah, I think uh, I will. It's just they make you do a lot of that, you know, uh, mm -hmm. strong side, support side. They make you shoot off rooftops. <laughs> they make you shoot off steps. They make you. And the thing right. about PRS is you have to think about it on the fly. Well, maybe beforehand, how you can approach that stage. They tell yeah. you what it is. Here's the target. Here's here's the support that you, you're allowed to use. Mm -hmm. You got a minute and a half. Go. And right. you have to engage targets you know, how, how you see fit. And sometimes, right. you know, me, like I said, I was not still not very good at it, but I would have this solid plan in my head mm -hmm. and then I'd go to shoot and midway through, <laughs> I changed my plan and then it just go to hell. And, yeah, yeah. Or, or I had a plan in my head that I had practiced mm -hmm. and then I'd see somebody else do something different. Yeah. And I go, Oh shit out. I'll do that. That looks right. easier than the way I was going to do it. Yeah. And the perfect example I had of that was they were using a tripod for rear support. Mm -hmm. And I had never in my life used that. That's but I cool. thought, yeah. holy crap, that's so easy. I'm yeah. I'm just going to do that. So when he got done shooting, and of course he cleaned the stage. Right. I go, hey. Uh, and I had only been practicing with the bag, with a sandbag, mm -hmm. and that's it. I said, hey, can I borrow your tripod? He goes, yeah, man, absolutely, which is the other you cool thing. You didn't even have a tripod? <laughs> I didn't, I, no. But again, man, this is the other cool thing. Way. You come a long way. <laughs> yes, I have. Well, you, you, you know why. Yeah, yeah. So, so the, uh, the other guy, uh, that's the other cool thing about PRS is, is in any, pretty much any sport, if you need something, mm -hmm. man, they're going to help you. They're, if they have it, you need it, here you go. It's, it's, yep. it's pretty right. cool. So he's like, yeah, absolutely. Oh my God! Worst mistake of my life. I didn't know how to shoot with a bipod, with a tripod. It looked easy. Right. Yeah. It yeah. turns out like he was just pulling it like nothing, and and mm -hmm. and when I tried to pull it, it collapsed on me. Because turns out you gotta <laughs> face it a certain. It, it, it was just I pulled. You know he was yeah. he was dragging it, right. and I reached across and I grabbed the other leg, and when I pulled it, it closed it up. It fell. Yeah. It, it was just. Uh, a nightmare. Yeah, yeah. But so that's, I did. But that's the experience. That, exactly. That's where, yeah, yeah. So every so match it was you do, a terrible experience. And from there on, I thought, yeah. okay, just do what I practice, which is bag only. And then right. I did pretty well the rest of the way. But yeah. anyway, yeah. it's just one of them deals, man, that it, you're going to find it fun because of, because of the, it's a dynamic sport. You can, you, you can do, like, you can shoot it one day and the next day you can come back and say, okay, it's the same as, it can be the exact same thing as last time, mm -hmm. but now they say, now you have to do a support side. Oh, crap. That just changed everything. Everything. You know? Yeah. So yeah. it's uh, we had a match one time. It was called the uh, Silent Night that I went to, and it's at night with suppressors. So it's cool, man. It's a cool match. But the first night, they had a two-minute part-time. So mm -hmm. you had to shoot the match every stage in two minutes. Well, the next night it was the exact same course of fire, except it was in ninety seconds. Mm -hmm. That oh, that in itself changed Changes everything. everything. Yeah. Because I was doing really good the night, the first night, but I was almost timing out every time. Mm -hmm. Well, guess what happened the next day? I, now I got to speed up by thirty seconds. That's right. a lot. Yeah. That's yeah. a lot. Thirty seconds doesn't sound like much. No, it's that's an lot. eternity when you're on. <laughs> yeah, when you're when you're on a stage, and I, I tell you, see. Shooting on shooting with a part time like that. That's why I'm a big fan of soldier shooting matches because you want to you want to talk about some self induced stress. Like one, everybody wants to do well. All right? I mean, so you so you put all this undue stress on you. You put it on a timer, and now all of a sudden you have in the back of your mind it, it's just, the, the clock's ticking, it's ticking, it's ticking. You're like, and then if you don't learn how to focus on the task at hand, like, like you have to put everything else out of your head. You have, you can't think about the timer. You can't think about anybody behind you 
to t- you can't think about how how well the guy did before you. You can't think about any of that, or you can't think about your last shot. You, you know all those mental things that go in. And that's why I think shooting competition is such a big deal, and it makes you a better shooter because of that self induced stress and having to shoot on a clock. Because you're right, that changes everything. If you oh, had dude. all the time in the world, <laughs> easy, right? Yes, yes. So the minute the inter- the minute the clock. They introduce that time element. It's it just yeah. changes everything. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, you're gonna enjoy it, and yes, I'm gonna take okay. you up on that. We got to link up. We'll go Absolutely. shoot. I appreciate and, uh, that. We'll have fun, I look man. To it. I look forward to it. And thanks for having me on your podcast. I really appreciate it. It's good seeing you again. I look forward to the next time. Hopefully, again, like we said, on the range. And uh, yeah, so you have a good weekend. And yeah, um, man, you too. I'll see you. I'll see you down the road. All right, man. Keep them centered. Later. Take care.